Oh, good morning, good morning, and good morning. I've got to get a wiggle on today, because I'm a little bit behind. It's a lovely day, a bit damp, low white cloud, perfect light for filming. I've got a new chip in my uh, dash cam because when I uh, take the chip out and put it in the computer, I've got a little converter, you know, one of these little converter things. Oh, just stay on the right side of the road. And uh, it was always very difficult to get the small chip in and out. So I thought I've got a Dremel. I'll put a couple of grooves in the edge of the chip, just a couple of notches so I can get my fingernail underneath it. Don't do that. Don't do this at home. Look at all this. They've got a big encampment on the left here because they're putting in a new electricity substation on the right. This is the size of the site that you need to install a new electricity substation. They've been like, it's been like that for about a month. Anyway, at least there's a bloke there working on site. Yeah, so apparently, who'd have thought it, if you take a tiny little chip with 100 meg 128 megabytes of RAM on it and you stick it in a, hold it and you dremel it, it um, bungles up a chip. Ha! Who'd have thought it? <laughs> so, fortunately they're only cheap. They're about, well, the Samsung Evo ones I've got are about 12, 13 pounds each. Although if you want to play a uh, SanDisk, you know, if you want to pay over the odds for a sand disc, then uh, you can pay 20, 30, 25, 30 quid. But anyway, you've got it overnighted on Amazon, don't you? So we're back in business. We've got dash cam. So, a couple of weeks ago, I read in the uh, dental media that the uh, House of Commons select committee was having an inquiry into dental services and um, they were they were going to have one I think for the last election and then it got cancelled so if I remember correctly they had one in 1992 and then they had another one again in 2007 and then they've had they haven't had one since so this is the first chance that uh, we've got really to uh, uh, for them to analyze the period uh, for the what I call the Cockroft years and uh, the trouble was that I read this uh, story on February the 5th or February the 8th or something, February the 5th, and uh, it said that the deadline for submissions had closed on January the 23rd. And I thought, that's a bit, you know, a bit of a rum do. They, having, having given written evidence and oral evidence to the, uh, to the previous two committees, albeit in my capacity as sort of Chief Executive of the Dental Practitioners Association. Um, I was, you know, I was, I was seriously thinking about, you know, perhaps putting in another submission uh, in a private capacity, but I, I was disappointed to learn that I'd missed the deadline. And then, um, Anyway, so I wrote to the chairman, uh, the, M the MP, Steve Bryan, and I said, oh, this is a bit of a, you know, you're not, you didn't give people much time to put submissions in, bearing in mind they publicised in December and it closed on January 23rd. And then, you know, I mean, two weeks of that was Christmas and two weeks of that I was away in Gambia. And anyway, the news wasn't published until February after the deadline was shut. So he said, look, he said, if you want to put some evidence in, put some evidence in. So I did. So I spent all yesterday typing 3,000 words of evidence, you know. Basically, my 2007 submission fully updated for 2023. And, um, but the way that they've, well, the way that they did it was that they, they sort of notified everybody who they're in bed with that they're going to have an inquiry. So that'll be the BDA, all the defence organisations, 
GDC, people like that. And then they said it went out to everybody on our mailing list, which is basically everybody who's, um, I don't know, they've got in their contact book, which won't include me because part of my submission was the fact that they routinely deleted the GDPA, the DPA and me out of their contact book. That was, that was actual, uh, one of the, one of the complaints. But, um, you know, apparently people who previously given oral and written evidence to, to an identical inquiries in the past aren't included on that list. They're not, they're not sort of the people that they uh, want to ask for evidence for. From. But anyway, you know, it all, it all came good in the end and I put my evidence in and I've offered to be, uh, I've offered to be uh, the sister committee by giving oral evidence, etc., etc. Let's see what they say. Now, what I'll do is I'll try and upload this submission and then link to it in the description uh, underneath the video so that you can download it and read it if you want to. Um, it's a pretty damning indictment of uh, the last 20 years or so, so the uh, 2002 to 2006 when um, Raman Betty was Chief Dental Officer and Barry Cockroft was his deputy and then 2006 to 2015 when Cockroft was uh, was Chief Dental Officer and the 2006 contract came in uh, and it's just you know it makes it points out a few home truths about why dentistry's collapsed they call these um, you know they, they say that we've got dental deserts now dental deserts and I think they should be called just deserts because I've, I've said before I think the lack of support that the public gave us when we went on strike in 1992 to try and save the service justifies the uh, you know our, our ignoring patients complaints now that the service has collapsed because it collapsed for reasons that we explained well in advance and which they chose to support the government over and not the profession so that's that's water under the bridge but um, I have explained that uh, uh, the deficiencies in the uh, pay review system why it doesn't set pay fairly uh, I've given them an alternative which is pendulum arbitration I've explained why prevention is failing in this country how in the uh, in dentistry and how if it, they got it to work in dentistry it could be rolled out across the NHS uh, the general principles and that's mainly because of a uh, concentration on toothbrushing in children at a time when they really should be concentrating on their diet cakes biscuits sweets fizzy drinks um, and this is this comes from the highest level I mean even now um, Barry Cockcroft is uh, proud of the fact that they gave away free toothbrushes and toothpaste. Emphasis being on the toothpaste because obviously Colgate is behind a lot of these things, and, and Johnson and Johnson is behind the Durafat over prescribing, etc. And uh, you know, there's a lot of corporate interests. The, the uh, uh, nice is been captured by corporate interests. Um, And then, uh, when when uh, patients turn 20, an emphasis should turn to uh, plaque control and brushing to prevent periodontitis in later tooth loss in later life. Um, the um, sort of the means-based approach, which again is based on promotion of free toothpaste, which is given to every dentist in the country, free uh, samples of TP brushes electric toothbrushes being given free to dentists etc sort of skews the uh, profession towards a, a means-based approach which basically states if you do X, Y, Z, A, B, C then your teeth will be healthy whereas in fact nobody really knows what plaque is, what it looks like, when they've got it, when, they have, when they've got rid of it um, And, uh, you know, whereas where a simple ends-based alternative, which is a, 
just to give everybody uh, disclosing tablets, do some supervised brushing, almost like treat them like they're at primary school. Do some supervised brushing and give them some disclosing tablets and a brush so they can't say that they haven't got the means, um, you know, which costs about, I don't know, 50 pence maximum per person. Is, uh, would be a much better approach but not at all supported by the profession, the manufacturers, you know, or the, or the hygienists. Um, there may be one or two uh, preventive uh, practitioners who, uh, who would support this. Now, the uh, point is that because we work in a system which is locked into a fee-based system where, and you can only charge patient charges as a proportion of a, of a fee. So, you know, if the dentist is gonna get 100 pounds, then the patient can be asked, say, to pay 25 or something. If the, um, the dentist is getting a fixed amount per month to treat the patient, on like on a capitation basis, then you're never gonna get the patients to set up a standing order or a direct debit for four pounds a month or something to maintain access to their NHS. I mean, I, that may change, that may change, but. And I'm sure there are many people who probably would set up a direct debit to be able to say that they've got an NHS dentist if it guaranteed them certain rights. But, um, you know, for many people, they would say, no, I don't see why I should, I pay my national insurance, you know, the famous line, I pay my national insurance. I don't see why I should have to pay extra to get, you know, to go on a dentist list. So the situation, I mean, the, the uh, solution is to uh, in, bring in a system <clears throat> which rewards dentists for preventive dentistry. And the way to do that is to pay them a fixed amount and allow them to keep the change if they spend less than you've allocated. Um, now you don't have to allow them to keep all of it, 100%. In fact, you can uh, share, you know, you can allow them to keep 75% or even 25% or something, but you have to allow them <coughs> Excuse me. To keep enough to warrant uh, you know, their their efforts to um, reduce uh, treatment demand, and that's uh, called a shared savings scheme. Uh, the uh, extension of that is that uh, what you do is you pay um, you can pay a flat rate, which covers basic dentistry, pretty much what's provided at the moment, but then deregulate charges to allow the dentist to charge a top-up um, you know if the patient wants a better quality crown or more time or better quality laboratories you know uh, or a better quality materials and that's the difference between NHS and private in a nutshell um, private dentistry you're you can take more time use better quality materials and better quality laboratories um, and because what you can do on the private, in the private sector, you can work up to a standard because you're not working down to a price. And for patients who want that uh, and, and who are still liable for national insurance payments, there's no reason why they should have their basic NHS uh, reimbursed, you know, what they would be entitled to anyway, and then just pay the difference between what the dentist would receive on the NHS for the work and what the dentist and the patient agree he will charge for work of a higher standard. Now, of course, the NHS hates this because they call it creeping privatisation and they say that uh, it's, uh, you know, private work should be the same standard as NHS work. Um, and any dentist who tells you otherwise is um, you know, a crook. And, uh, and that uh, dentists are, are crooks and would therefore, you know, start charging twice as much for NHS fillings as, as the state pays, with the implication that the patient wouldn't get the work if they didn't pay the extra, the, 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 the uh, surcharge. Well, I don't think in practice, I, I don't think, and I believe me, I have carefully considered all the arguments against this. And providing there were some dentists who were prepared to work for the state fees then um, 
the patient would have the option just to change dentists and go to another dentist that would do the work for the state fee. There are, <clears throat> and, and the state would have to pay a reasonable fee. Because <coughs> the other, you know, possibility that the state suddenly decides that they're going to put, now, now that the patients can top up, they're going to put the fee for a filling down to a pound. Um, and uh, and and then the patients would then have to then you know obviously make up, but, but they they couldn't do that because a large number of patients probably I don't know somewhere I don't know exactly but I mean somewhere between thirty and fifty percent probably higher um, couldn't afford to make up the difference because they're on they're fully remitted or they're exempt, and so as a result um, don't do it don't do it gonna try and nip up the outside but it's a police car so we're not gonna stop them or they know they're a fire engine so you know there would always be dentists that would be working uh, at the state at a the state would always have to pay fees sufficient to ensure that there were enough dentists to provide treatment for exempt patients and then the non-exempt patients who wanted uh, basic service could go and see those dentists. So <clears throat> as a system it would work quite well but the whole point is that it would encourage uh, uh, quality to improve and the shared savings approach would mean that um, dentists would automatically seek out, would be driven towards preventive ways of working um, because they'd be seeking to maximise the amount of money that they save. And so they are. They would have to take a long, hard look at their, you know, their just their, their, their superficial advice to brush a bit better, or are you brushing two times a day? Do you use floss approach, and realise that it's not working? It's not really uh, reducing disease, and therefore they will have to seek new ways, effective ways of reducing disease, because effective ways of reducing disease leads to, into effective ways of saving money and if you can keep the difference then uh, you've got a system that works really well I mean really well I mean can you imagine can you imagine how efficient the NHS would be if the uh, if, the, if, if the Department of Health said to everybody who worked in the NHS if you can think of a way of saving money in the NHS We'll let you keep the money that's saved. We'll let you keep it. We're spending it anyway. We'll let you keep it. Well, they wouldn't have to do that. They, they would say, we'll let you keep half of it, which is a similar, you know, like they do in factories, for example, in the car factory. If you find a way of saving five pence on making every car, you get rewarded financially because that car company then becomes much more efficient. And it's the same with the NHS. If they just said to people, if you can think of a way of saving money, well, that you keep 25% of any money that's saved for the next for the first five years. Oh my God! Think, can you imagine how much money would get saved? Anyway, I've got to run because I'm late. Oh. So anyway, I'll put a link to it and then uh, have a read of it and then uh, and possibly let me know what you think. All right. Nice to talk to you. Bye.